purpose of religiously function is. Do you remember the context you saw them in? Yeah. yeah. Human, population. human population. So logistic functions are used to model things with a carrying capacity or some sort of limit to something like a population or an amount of something. When you're above that value, the functions decrease. When you're below that value, they increase. And then in real life situations, what do you sometimes see the functions go above? Yeah, but then they get, oh yeah. Real life situations tend not to be perfectly clean, but the idea is a logistic model helps you understand what's going on in many real life situations that have a carrying capacity, that have a carrying capacity. So the family they live inside, and it's a big block of text. We're going we're gonna to parse this block of text. That's our first task. We're going to talk about the pieces of it. It's from the family of differential equations. Do you remember what the definition of a differential equation was? It's a really straightforward definition. It's literally something that just has a rate of change in it. Differential means change. It's an equation with a rate of change in it. That's it. That's all it is. So can a differential equation be many, 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 many different things? Absolutely. So we might not understand yet what each of those letters is, right? Which is totally fine. But what do you see inside this equation? Equation, equal sign. What do you see inside that equation that makes it a differential equation? The PDT. The PDT. So this is a differential equation because it literally just has a differential. And how have we seen what differential equations look like in this class? It was a topic you did last year in AB Calculus. What was the method for visualization? How did we see what a differential looked like? We graph functions, right? That's what we like to graph. We graph a polynomial, we might graph a cubic, we might graph a polar. A differential is a function, but we don't generally graph the one differential because if I give you a derivative, how many functions can have that derivative? An infinite number of them, right? Plus c, right? They move around a whole lot, right? But we have visualized all of those before in the topic, ah, slope fields. You can take a differential, a differential equation, and plot out all the little differentials to your hearts. Can you get as dense as you want? Sure, absolutely. But you remember that whole discussion we had about currents, like ocean currents on the floor? This is the same idea. Dif logistic differential equations all look relatively similar. There's a horizontal line, and the horizontal line is at the what? It's at the, if it's a population, it's at the, what's that term called? You get to see energy. Pairing capacity of the population. It's the limit. If you go above it, the population diminishes. If you're below it, the population increases. Or if it's peak oil, it might be how much was the maximum oil production. So this is the slope field that you will see time and again with logistic differential equations. This right here is going to be the limit of the pairing capacity of the population. And below it, if you start it somewhere down here in your initial condition, what's going to happen to you? And in a perfect world, it's infinitely close to below. But what do we know? What, what happens in the real world? Sometimes it goes above and then it goes below. You know, you can model what you can model. But if you start up here, generally speaking, if I plot this solution, which is if I drop a buoy into this ocean current, what's it going to do? It's going to come down like this. It's going to come down. So let's look at a few more pictures here. We looked at one of the paths that L is the carrying capacity, and the general structure of the curve is it's concave up. Then there's an inflection point, and it's concave down. The general path from below. But what about above? What is that going to do? It's going to be concave up the entire time. And what happens if you put a point that's above L over 2? It's all going to be concave down. The circle of changes to concave up once it gets past L over 2. So the real fun comes in, I think, two places, at least for me. One, what does the logistic look like? And they're all going to look to a certain degree just like this. They're going to look just like that. But another question could be, if I gave you a slope field, you've done this before, and I said, here's an initial condition, what can you do with that one initial condition? What could you then do? Yeah, you could draw your solution. You'd be like, oh, it kind of looks like maybe like this, right? Something like that, at least. Or I could say, oh, what's this one going to be? No, it's going to be that, right? You can sketch them. How accurate are your sketches going to be? Ooh, it could be anywhere from not accurate at all to decently accurate. What might it be really helpful for you to be able to do? Given a point, find the what? 
find what well, we we find the slope, but we just sketch the functions for certain solutions. We could actually find the the equation. Find and we've done that before. You have done that before with other slope fields. Here's an initial condition, and you've integrated. Remember separation of variables. Remember I said that was like the easiest points on the AP exam. You separate the variables, you integrate, you find the constant, you're done, and that's like five points. You should get real happy. It's the same thing here. What does the general function look like? This is what it looks like. You have dp dt equals k p one. Okay, what's the variable there? There's only one variable in that because hey, we're still in single variable calculus. So take part. There's only one variable. What's the only variable? No, p. P is the population. T is going to be time. What about L? The carrying capacity, that horizontal line. And what's K going to be? Some constant, like directly proportional to this thing, right? So this right here is a differential that has the P, D, T in it. What would it be really nice to be able to isolate and get isolate, and then what else, what else would it be nice to get rid of? It'd be, it'd be really nice to write a function what in terms of what? P, no, no. So K and L are just going to be constants floating around. It's going to be P in terms of T. It'd be really nice to go to like P in terms of T. Because then all you need to be able to do is plug in K and an L value and you have the function. You have the function itself. So remember that happy place you go to when you do separation of variables? You remember that happy place? Okay, very nice. Oh, it's so exciting. What's the best word that I just, what's the best two words that I just I exposed? No, keep going, keep going. I don't like tables. Why would I want you to use a table? Oh, or by partial fractions. It's so nice. <laughs> so the challenge is, this one's relatively easy to integrate in terms of T, right? But over here, you have to integrate this with respect to P. We have PL minus P squared. So what did they do here? Partial fraction decomposition, exactly. So it's partial fractions right here. You got that DP still out there. So then what can you do to each of these pieces? You cannot integrate each piece separately, right? Because it's only P in there. So what do you end up with? Ln P minus Ln actually L minus P equals K P plus C. Yay, exciting. But what have we not isolated yet? What have we not isolated? P. Remember how we needed to isolate P? So what was our whole goal? So you have this. So here, K. What's minus mean when you want? Divide. So you have bit, uh, what did they do here? They did it as, oh, they took out the negative. Yeah, they took out the negative sign of the here. You follow that, everybody? They do things like this, and it's really annoying. Because you see minus, right? So you feel over this, right? Well, what's it, what, is that the same thing right there? Yeah, give it the negative. Yeah, they multiply both sides by negative one to turn it into this. This is called pulling stuff out of thin air because the first time through they didn't get quite exactly what they wanted and realized if they changed course up here, it's a lot nicer downstream. This is kind of a random step. They do this, they do this. This looks familiar. You're like, you did the negative C here. We've done things like this before, right? Oh, it's nice. Okay, we have plus or minus. You do net, you are not going to prove this on the AP test. This is not something to prove. That's why we're not doing this out like piece by piece, but the general idea so far, we've separated the variables, we used partial fraction decomposition, we integrated each little piece, and now what do we do? We're solving for what? We're solving for P. We're solving for P. Yes, Ali? Logistic differential. So the solution ends up being P equals L over 1 plus A E to the negative KT. And what do they do? A is this thing right here. They, it's interesting that they have limits with regard to how complicated something you can get. What's T not? Initial. initial population, exactly. It's your initial population. So this, what else do you have to memorize? This. That's just two things you have to memorize. And if you memorize those two things, your life is really quite easy because here's the thing. Let's say I gave you a specific differential. Let's say I gave you this, and I told you a K value, and I told you an L value, and then I said, what is P of T? Are you going to want to have to separate and integrate every single time? No. No, you're not. No, you're not. So this is the path you're going to take. If I give you this, and if you memorize this, what can you just do? Substitution. Just plug it in. That's it. 
That's all you have to do. You are not required to prove this. And you need to understand the method, and it's a method we've seen before. So one way to look at these logistic differentials is to find the actual path. Another way might be to look at them on your calculator or look at them by hand. What do you know about doing slope fields by hand? They're excruciatingly long. Differential here. You put the differential here. You put it. It's, it might have y in it, but you actually type out y if you need the alpha y. Your differential is going to be a little complicated. So, for example, this one right here. What did we decide we wanted to use? 0.05p, right? Oh, for logistic, we're not going to have it, but it can handle it. So, 0.05x times. Help me out here. 1 minus x over 2800. Uh, 1 minus x divided by 2800. And this is the program I used a while ago. We'll see how it does, how it works. We quit out of this, and then I can give you this program or you can get it. It's really not that hard to load. I'll show you how to load it. You just run the program. Enter. There we go. Check out what it does. Isn't that pretty neat? Now, now here's the thing. What is some some default settings? It's putting them at the lattice points, each individual lattice point. The thing about logistic differentials is that is this the useful part of the window that we want to see? No. Going back to our function here, what was the carrying capacity of that of that uh, 2800? So after you do the slope field, kind of like when you graph anything on your calculator, you need to make sure you have the appropriate what. Appropriate window. You need to make sure you have the appropriate window. If you don't have the appropriate window, it's not very helpful. Now, I can then play around with the window a whole bunch. I could go, uh, you know, x, x min is going to be zero. Let's make x max. <laughs> what should we make the x max? <laughs> let's try 50. Sure, let's see what happens. And let's see if we can short out the calculator program. Y minimum? Zero. What about the y max? Let's say 3,000, 3, right? So, who wants to take bets as if this is going to break the program? <laughs> ah, so what should the scale be? Or let's make the X, yeah, X scale 5, maybe? And what do, you, what do you want to make the Y scale? Let's make it 300. Let's just start there, because what happens if we kept it at 1? Yeah, so let's graph this thing. Oh boy, still short it out a little bit. There are tons and tons of slope. I'm going to let it keep going here. We might actually have to keep it at one and one. Um, I can't remember what the specific numeric limitations are on this one. Function right there, we know that P is going to be equal to what? 4,000. And we're going to figure out A in a second. A, sorry, 1 plus A E to the what? 0, 6, 8, T. What do we have to find out now? A. Do you remember what A was equal to? This takes practice. L minus P naught over. Nice. So, do they give us an initial population on this? No. So, can you go any further? Can the, can you go any further on this? Is what I'm asking. So, you would need an initial population. So, you could take this and substitute it in for A if you wanted to. You put you could right, but the idea is can you go any further? You would need an initial population to actually give you a value for a. You would need an initial population. It's leaving it in a form that you can write it down. You will see it written like this a whole lot. Let me scroll down a little bit. I think I pasted it in there. Oh look, look familiar? How's that look? Yay! Very nice. Okay, we're doing okay so far. What about this one though? You gotta find K L A a formula for P as a function of T. So what do you first notice about how this differential is written? Yeah. Exactly. They kind of multiplied it out. So what do we have to do? Uh, not divide it. Factor! There we go. We do factoring in algebra two today. We do factoring in BC. Excellent. We do factoring all over the place. Nice. So what do we want to turn this into? Ten P? Times what? One minus. It's just p over two, right? No, you had it. You, you say two a. It's fine. Did, did, is that correct? I think it's correct, right? So what does that tell us? K is ten. It tells us l is what? Two. And do they give us a p naught on this one? 
Well, it tells us it's L over 4, so that tells us, you know, that A is what? L minus P naught over, so what is A going to be equal to? L minus over 4 over what? <laughs> yeah, you're doing the fractions out? <laughs> you're doing the fractions out? So what do we have here? Uh, oh, is it 3? Is it 3? Yeah, because it's like 1 minus a quarter over a quarter, so it's 3. Over a half. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you have three quarters on top and one quarter on the bottom, so it's three. Oh, A is three. So what does that tell us P is equal to? L over. So two over one plus A is three E to the negative 10 C. Exactly. Hey, how do we do? How does that look? Yay, we did it. Yeah.